So good afternoon uh, and welcome to our 2018 Leslie Whittington Memorial Lecture. So my name is Michael Bailey. I'm a professor here at Georgetown and I'm also the interim dean here. So um, this is a, a special day for us for uh, two reasons at least. Um, and so one is it's a, um, something we're always eager to do is to uh, you know, have an uh, interesting, stimulating speaker come, you know, uh, uh, tell us, you know, new and exciting perspectives and so forth and really engage in kind of policy discussions. That's the kind of thing that, that we love so much to do at McCourt. Um, but even more, it's a special day for us uh, because it's a day uh, where we uh, honor Leslie Whittington. So um, Leslie was a professor here. Um, and uh, as I'm sure you all know, um, she and her family passed away <clears throat> on September 11th, uh, 2001. Um, so uh, I actually wasn't a, a member of the George uh, McCourt, then GPPI faculty. I was a member of the Department of Government. But I got to know Leslie. Um, she was, we were on a search committee. And I remember uh, her driving me home from a, uh, from a search committee dinner and uh, describing um, the, you know, the, her trip to Australia. Um, so, uh, as we know, that um, did not happen, and uh, you know, we miss Leslie very much. Um, and so that's uh, kind of a, a special moment for us to, to get together. We do this every year, obviously. Um, and the other thing that, that you know, as we um, kind of relive that moment, um, we see the, the news today out of Florida. Um, and that also reminds us uh, in a very different way but that, that tragedy and, 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 and um, you know, terrible things, it's, it's uh, continued to happen. So I'd like to ask for a, a moment of silence, both for Leslie uh, and for the uh, people affected in Florida and for this whole country. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so, but the way that we uh, honor Leslie's memory is that we do what she loved. Um, and as I said, that's engage. Um, in a critical, thoughtful, respectful uh, discussion of policy issues. And so this is a, a real treat to, to have this event for us. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to introduce one of our star students who will then get the show started for us uh, and introduce our, our featured guests. So um, Rachel Cost is our, um, the winner of the McCourt School's um, Whittington Memorial Scholarship. And so, uh, she won this. She's a very impressive uh, a record of service and scholarship here at McCourt. So among other things, she has been the co-president of a Women in Public Policy Initiative. Uh, she served on um, a, a strategy team for GU Politics. Those of you know, who know our Institute of Politics and Public Service know we have strategy teams, uh, uh, and Rachel was part of that. Um, she also uh, won a President's Volunteer Service Award for over 100 hours of community service. Um, with the, the Girl Scouts uh, uh, and other, other groups. So, uh, and another thing that, that um, she, uh, that got her to this place was a very, very impressive GPA. So I have here it written, I'm not gonna say it, but they went out to three digits <laughs> in, the, uh, in it here. It, it, you don't have to round much to get to four, I'll say. Um, I think some one person gave you an A minus. If I'm, <laughs> so will. Um, but so uh, Rachel's been a very, very impressive student and a very, very impressive member of our community. So I am honored to introduce her uh, to help us uh, introduce our guests. Rachel. Before I introduce our speakers this afternoon, I just want to briefly say how honored I am to have received the Whittington Scholarship this year. Um, not only is it truly a great honor, um, it's also the financial support it's provided has played a really big part in even letting me study here at Georgetown um, and letting me get the most out of my McCord experience. So I'm very appreciative of that. I also wanted to let you know that if you are using social media during tonight's event, we do have a hashtag, and that's Brooks at GU. You can also tag the McCord School in any tweets that you have tonight. To moderate our discussion with David Brooks this afternoon, we have E.J. Dion, who is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, a syndicated columnist for the Washington Post, and a professor here at the McCourt School. He is a nationally known and respected commentator on politics, and he appears weekly on NPR and regularly on MSNBC. He's also the author of several books on American politics and has received numerous awards for his contributions to political journalism. 
It is my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's lecturer, David Brooks. Mr. Brooks has been an op-ed columnist for the New York Times since 2003, and his column appears every Tuesday and Friday. He writes mostly about pol politics, culture, and the social sciences. He's also a frequent guest on PBS NewsHour, NPR's All Things Considered, and NBC's Meet the Press. He teaches at Yale and is also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Please join me, join me in welcoming David Brooks to the podium. Thank you, Rachel. I want you to know I also had a 4.0 GPA in college, but I spread it out over four years. So I got one, 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 and one. Um, also, uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be in this room. I've never been in this room before. Uh, if I am good and God rewards me, this will be what my bedroom looks like in heaven. Um, I am sort of a bookish person uh, by nature. Um, when I was seven, I read a book called Paddington the Bear. And I decided at that moment I want to become a writer. Uh, and I've been writing pretty much every day ever since, uh, surrounding myself with these things. I remember in high school I wanted to date a woman named Bernice. Um, she didn't want to date me. She wanted to date some other guy. And I remember thinking, what is she thinking? I write way better than that guy. <laughs> uh, but, so she had different values. Uh, and then I went to a very bookish college uh, when I was 18. The admissions officers at Brown, Wesleyan, and Cornell decided I should go to the University of Chicago. Uh, and which the, the saying about Chicago is it's where fun goes to die. Uh, but the best one about Chicago, it's uh, a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas uh, in some ways. And I, while I was there, I managed a, a boxer, uh, the kosher killer. Uh, we didn't actually box, practice boxing. We read books about boxing and sent him into the ring where he was knocked out after about 93 seconds. Um, and so I am sort of a bookish person and surrounded by this, and I'm always happy to be back at a college and university. Um, but I, I want to start by talking about the frame within which uh, we talk about public policy. Uh, and uh, I am bookish, uh, and I like s studies and all that social science sort of stuff. But it's appropriate that we're uh, celebrating Leslie Whittington because she was someone who wrote about children and families and how public policy could influence the most intimate affairs of our life. And I want to start by arguing that, um, that our reasoning consciousness, is, which is what most of what we do in a university, is actually the third most important part of our consciousness. That if we want to understand public policy, uh, we, uh, we got to understand the other two. And we understand where we are. We have to understand and give due appreciation to the other two. And the first important part of our consciousness, as my hero, St. Augustine, would have said, uh, is the heart is the desiring heart. I read about a guy not long ago who had a, um, who bought a house with a driveway, and outside the driveway there was a bamboo tree shooting up. And he hated bamboo. So he chopped it down, he took an axe, dug out, chopped up the roots, he poured, poured plant poison into the bed there, he covered it over with gravel, he covered it over with cement. And two years later, bamboo is shooting through the cement. And in my view, we have something like that in ourselves. We have a desiring heart, which is just always propelling us forward, as Augustine said. And what is basically propelling us toward is our own flourishing, which is union with others. We want to build community and relationships with others, the kind of union that uh, Louis de Bernier described in his book, Captain Corelli's Mandolin. Uh, he, in that book, he's, I hope somebody's read it here, he's got an old guy talking to his daughter about his relationship with his late wife. And he writes, love itself is what is left over when being in love is burned away. And this is both an art and a fortunate accident. Your mother and I had it. We had roots that grew toward each other underground. And when all the pretty blossoms had fallen from our branches, we found out that we were one tree and not two. And that's the desiring heart. The second most important quality, which shouldn't need to be said at a place like Georgetown, uh, is the yearning soul. Now, it's not my department to tell you whether to believe in God or not. Somebody else can do that. But I do want to persuade you, you do have a soul. Uh, you have a piece of you that has no shape, size, or color, but it is of infinite value and dignity. Rich and successful people don't have more of it than poor and less successful people. Uh, and what this thing does is it yearns for righteousness. It yearns for goodness. We want to lead good lives. I've never met anybody who didn't want to lead a good life. 
even when you meet a sociopath, they usually have some explanation for why what they did was either good or explainable. And it just orients us in that direction. And the soul is sometimes reclusive, sometimes, especially early in your life, you don't really think about it very much. You're building your family, you're building your career. You can go through college focusing on those things and not paying attention to the yearnings of the soul. But eventually it comes down, it sits in the floor with you and says, what have you done with your life? What good have you served? What purpose have you served? And if you haven't answered those questions, uh, you'll be aware of it. And if you haven't answered those questions, uh, your life will have no sense of purpose and no sense of meaning. And it's likely to fall apart with the smallest flick. I noticed this in some of my students who haven't given that question a thought. They're amazing students. They go off into the world and they have what I call a telos crisis. Uh, they have one setback and everything falls apart. Nietzsche said, he who has a why to live for can endure any how. But if you don't know your why, then when the setbacks come, the how knocks you off. And one of the things uh, desiring and yearning creatures do is they build moral ecologies to solve their problems. They get together and create cultures to solve the problems of the day. And over the course of the past few decades, I think we've been through a few different periods. From 1932 to 1968, there was a period they had to confront big problems, the Depression, World War II. They needed to get together in big institutions to solve those problems. So they had a very group-oriented ethos, which you could call, we're in this together. They worked to work for the Army, for IBM, for labor unions, and they founded tight communities. There's a great book called The Lost City by Alan Ehrenholt on what it felt like to live in that tight community. He said, if you were growing up in Chicago that, in those days, you probably did what your father did. You went to work at the Nabisco plant. You probably worked for the same union that he worked for. If they asked you where you were from, you didn't say, I'm from Chicago. You said, I'm from 59th and Pulaski, because the neighborhoods were so tight and intertwined. They didn't have TV back then. They really didn't have air conditioning. And so on the in summer nights, everybody was just flowing out into each other's homes, and they had tight communities. And they served big organizations deferentially. There was a politician named Jim Farley, who Boss Daly sent to the state legislature for 20 years. And as a reward, at the end of his career, he said, OK, we're going to send Farley out to Congress just so he can serve in Congress for two years. So the press asked Farley, uh, what would you do? What, how are you going to vote in Congress? And he said, I will go to Washington to represent Mayor Daley. For 21 years, I represented the mayor in the legislature, and he was always right. That's a level of deference we don't see in, in public life or in any life much. And that community had a lot of strengths, tight communities, good friendships, good belonging. That culture had some weaknesses, racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, emotional coldness, especially fathers to their kids, uh, really boring food. Uh, and so there's a transition. Desiring, yearning creatures, they say that culture is not working for us anymore, and they shift. And I have great faith in human ingenuity. There's, I've forgotten her name, there's a philosopher who says, cultural change happens by this process. Ratchet, hatchet, pivot, ratchet. We ratchet up, we solve a problem. It lasts for a while, it stops working, so we hatch it, we dig it apart. And it's a bumpy period. Then we pivot, find something new, and ratchet up again. It works. And 1968 was such a period, or the 1960s were a hatchet period, and we're living in another one, where the old system isn't working, you gotta find something new. And in the early 60s, a group of students came together in Port Huron, Michigan, and created something called the Port Huron Statement, Students for Democratic Society. And it said that old group culture isn't working for me anymore. And, it, and they created a new culture, which was very individualistic, autonomy, and that culture was not we're in this together, that culture was I'm free to be myself. And that worked too for a little while. Gave us the civil rights movement, gave us feminism, gave us, I think we could not have had an information age economy if we didn't have a much more creative individualistic culture. But we're sort of running out of the string on that one. Uh, and so what we've got, I think, as we exit the phase of individualism is three overwhelm, overlapping social crises. The first is a crisis of social solidarity. That groupiness has been replaced by loneliness and atomization. In 1980, 20% of Americans reported feeling lonely. Now twice as many do. 35% of people over 45 are chronically lonely. A generation ago, only 8% of Americans lived alone. Now nearly 30% do. In 1970, married couples entertained their friends in their home on average 15 times a year. Now it's eight times a year. 
The fastest growing political party is unaffiliated. The fastest growing religious movement is unaffiliated. We've got a complete collapse of social trust. And that leads to the second crisis, which is the crisis of the institutions. During that we're in this together period, if you ask people, do you trust government to do the right thing most of the time, 80% said yes. Now it's like 20%. If you ask people, uh, do you trust the people around you? A generation ago, the majority said, yeah, the people around me are trustworthy. Now only 32% say that, and only 22% of millennials say that. And so we've just pervasive social distrust, which makes it hard to do anything collective, anything big. And then the third is, I think, a, a crisis of, of, uh, of meaning, a crisis of spirituality. Part of it is this telos crisis, this loneliness. It's astonishing to me that after all we've learned about the human brain and the human psyche, that depression rates are going up, not down. Mental health is going up, not down. Suicide is going up, not down. We see lonely guys with guns in Florida, and we get events like this. And so that's, in part, a crisis of policy, but it's in part, it's a crisis of meaning and solidarity. Uh, that not only do we have a group of people who are very sad, uh, what David Woster Wallace described as something that doesn't have much to do with physical circumstances or the economy or the stuff that gets talked about in the news. It's more like a stomach level sadness. I see it in myself and my friends in different ways. It manifests itself in a kind of lostness. This is a generation that has an inheritance of absolutely nothing as far as meaningful moral values are concerned. And so it's not that people are bad, but I think people have been raised in an age of, um, that is morally inarticulate, where their elders have given them no moral vocabularies to figure out what's my purpose, what's my meaning to satisfy the yearnings of the soul. And so when you get a lonely, nakedly individualistic, atomized, alienated culture, it's a recipe for tribalism. And that's who came in. They came in and said, we've got to, the I'm free to be myself isn't working. We've got another culture. And that culture for you is return to tribe. And we see it around the world with the rise of populism. We see it with some radical forms of multiculturalism. Uh, and the tribal mentality is always a warrior mentality. It's always us versus them. It's always we're in this because they're bad. And we see that most with Donald Trump, but we see it everywhere else. Politics is war, ideas are combat, society is tribal, mistrust is the worldview. Build walls, erect barriers. And so a lot of us, and this t takes me to the moment we're in right now, I think, a lot of us said, you know, we understand the individualism probably went a little too far, probably needed some other way to connect, but this tribal thing, it's just not the way we want to go. And so for about a year, especially after the election of Donald Trump, a lot of us were back on our heels. We're like, we're just daily appalled. But what do we do? And we were only really asking that question for a little while. Now I think people are, gonna are beginning to ask that question. I've been traveling around the country, and everywhere I go, people are leaping into action. They say, you know, we sort of, we know what we're against, but we don't really know what we're for. We have some vague words, cultural pluralism, ethnic diversity, common civic conversation, civility. But you know they have a process. I spent some time a few months ago with Steve Bannon, and it was like being with Trotsky in 1905. I mean, the guy had a theory of history. He knew where his intellectual forefathers were. He knew who his international alliances were, Nigel Farage, uh, Viktor Orban. He had a 50-year plan. And Donald Trump was just one piece of the plan. And you can agree or disagree, but there's a coherence and conviction there. And a lot of us who want to be the opposite of Steve Bannon don't have that. So we know what we're against, we don't know what we're for. We're dispersed and we're disorganized. A lot of us have lost touch with the country. We're defensive and demoralized. But what I see over the, la over the last two or three months is everybody starting organizations. Wherever I go, somebody's saying, yeah, I'm starting a project to do that. And in my experience, those projects, whether it's the National Constitution Center or Duke University or Condi Rice out at Stanford, or the National Endowment for Democracies, they fall into about five or six lanes or buckets. There's sort of a civic education bucket saying people do not know the uh, curriculum of democracy. Why do we love democracy so much? What did John Stuart Mill have to teach us? The second lane is the social cohesion lane, the community building lane of creating social capital. The third is economic mobility, 
We're divided by, on class lines. How do we solve that? The, the fourth is a spiritual, a secular sermon lane. People think it's fine, primarily a crisis of meaning. The fifth is the depolarizers. How do we get reds and blues together in a room to actually talk to each other? And then the sixth is the international one. What's our purpose in the world? And I find these, the sort of a, a renaissance of policy groups. But more than policy groups, it's the layer just beneath policy. We have our policy debates, but they happen within a nest. And to me, what's been bespoiled is the nest. What makes us a people? How do we talk to each other? How do we practice intellectual virtue and rely on evidence? And rebuilding that nest within which we have our policy debates is the thing I notice a lot of people working on. And so it seems to me the first thing to do is get all those people together to form a movement. In the progressive era, which is an era sort of like our own, uh, they had the temperance movement. They had the settlement house movement. They had the environmental movement. They had the clean government movement. Somebody decided, oh, you know, we're all part of the same thing. We're all part of progressivism. And that gave them not only strength of solidarity, but it also gave them political purchase. Somebody has to do that. The second task is to hold up a better way to live. One of the things that the Port Huron folks understood when they, came, when they created that document in 1962, they understood that social transformation flows out of personal transformation. You had to hold up a better way to live. Uh, and so what they did was they put personal values right at the front. And they said, it's not that we're going to improve society. We're going to live in a way that's more free and more honest. And what I, I've been going to a lot of schools looking, uh, asking young people uh, what they have faith in. Uh, because, you know, the, the future isn't going to be led by 56-year-old white guys. It's going to be led by today's students. And what I, the first thing you find is there's a lot of disillusion. I mean, I, when, in my lifespan, I got to, I came, I wasn't born when the World War II was happening, but I heard those stories. When I was a really little kid, the Civil Rights Movement was happening, a good story. I got to see America and the West win the Cold War, a good story. It was sort of implicit in me that things were moving upward and there was goodness there. If you're born in 1980, 84, 90, well, financial crisis, Iraq, 9-11, Donald Trump. It's hard to have faith in institutions if that's your life story. And yet what I, what I do see is a lot of, in my interviews, people saying, I know we need institutions, I just don't know which ones work, and are searching for that. But what I mostly see in the life stories, which is, makes me most hopeful, especially on a day like today, is I'm, I'm writing this up for tomorrow, but I, I started calling them amphibians students who were great at thriving in radically different environments. They were from one country, and, an, and one parent was from one country, one from another, and yet they were good in a third country. They came from rural America, they were good in East Coast University. They came from the big city, they were doing mission work in rural Texas. Amazing number of kids who were planted here and planted there and have created a synthesis out of their own lives. If you need the sort of people who can create cohesion out of disunity, which is what we have, those are the sort of people we have. And the final thing, and I think this is the big challenge for students, especially in their 20s, is making commitments. To me, the, the process should not be, uh, we go from I'm free to be myself to back to tribe. It should be, we're free to be myself, but I commit to you. Uh, an ethos that really emphasizes commitment making. I've been thinking a lot about this over the last four years. And it, you know, it seems clear to me that most of us in the course of our lives make four big commitments. To a spouse and family, to a vocation, to a community, and to a philosophy of faith. And the fulfillment of our lives depend on how well we choose those commitments and how well we execute upon them. And the health of a society depends on how well people can anchor themselves down. The sort of anchoring that um, you know, in the Bible that, that Ruth did to Naomi, where you go, I will go, where you lodge, I will lodge, your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And so I haven't talked much about re regression studies and public policy, because I think that's not quite where the need is right now. Before we get to those arguments about the st what studies make for a better tax plan, we need to rediscover who we are as a people, 
how we're connected, and how to live an admirable life that we can hold up and that can join us together. And so that has been my focus. Uh, thank you. Thank you, David. Welcome to Georgetown. Thank you. I am very grateful David is here. David and I have been friends for a long time. We've been on the radio together. We recently learned 18 years. And I love him even though no one has ever directed a harsher insult my way than David Brooks. He once said of me, I am the only person he ever met whose eyes light up at the words panel discussion. So I am very happy to be here today in a two-person panel discussion. I also want to salute David's humility. If I heard that lecture right, Bernice made the right decision all those years ago by putting books and reason as a very low uh, measure of, uh, of, her, of her choice. Um, I want to begin um, by reflecting on the day we are remembering with Leslie Whittington. And for those of you who didn't know her, I did not know her. I arrived here shortly after uh, her, her terrible and tragic death. Um, but you heard around this place the most extraordinary things about her. And you knew these weren't things said about a person because she died a tragic death. Uh, they were said about her because she really was an extraordinary person. And so the question I wanted to ask you, David, I want to go into um, some of what you uh, talked about. But in a way, it relates to what you talked about. Um, I'd like you to look back uh, at the years uh, from September 11, 2001 forward. Um, and talk a bit about what has surprised you. Because if we take uh, uh, in what happened and what has not surprised you, because if we think back to that time in the context of what you just told us, um, it actually was a rare moment of national solidarity. It was a rare moment when people were thinking in selfless uh, ways. Um, and it seemed for a brief period that the country would move in a rather different direction than we moved in. And I'm curious how you've reflected on that over the years. Yeah, I, I mentioned in the column recently that I covered Europe in the 1990s, and I covered almost essentially nothing but good news. I covered the decline of the fall of the Soviet Union, the reunification of Germany, um, and Mandela coming out of prison in South Africa, the end of apartheid, Oslo peace process in the Middle East. It was just a triumph of liberal democracy. And we seemed to be heading in this right direction. And then there was one event that leapt out at the end, which I didn't pay much attention to, but which was the war in Yugoslavia. And in retrospect, the war in Yugoslavia was the most important event of that period, because it was a rise in violence and tribalism and separatism. Uh, and that has been happening since. And 9-11 was us being attacked by a, a sort of um, violent separatism or uh, attack on liberal democracy. And for a moment, uh, we did seem to be unified by it. Uh, and perhaps that was the greatest moment squandered uh, in our lifetimes. Uh, because since then, uh, it was squandered. I supported the Iraq war, a clear mistake, squandered that moment. Uh, didn't ask for common sacrifice, didn't take it as an advantage, an exercise to do some sort of national service, anything that might bring the country together. And what's happened to me, the most significant thing that's happened since then, it's not a good news story, is that we've lost a sense of uh, national narrative. To me, one of the reasons I supported the war was I thought, well, there's a country that advances democracy, that believes we're the last best hope of Earth, and that some form of democracy and dignity for all is what we stand for. And having lived through the Cold War, I'd seen it spread through Central Europe. I thought, we can extend it, the borders. Uh, and that turned out not to be the case. That turned out to be naive. And the casualties among the real life human casualties, there was a national narrative casualty. I've always thought the national narrative was an exodus narrative. We left oppression, we crossed the wilderness, we came to the promised land of democracy. And that was our national story. The pilgrims had that story, immigrants had that story, civil rights movement had that story. But what I find today is people no longer believe in that narrative because they don't believe this land of milk and honey. We're too wrapped up in, in slavery and, and error. And so to me, we have to come up with a new national narrative. We can't use the one we thought we were operating by 9-11, to me the narrative has to be some sort of redemption and forgiveness, that we're a young experiment that's been betrayed and we have to find ways to put ourselves on paths to forgiveness and restore the experiment. But uh, it was, it's been a, since 9-11, one trend after another has been a, a loss of faith inducing experience, I would say. 
By the way, I want to say we are going to have questions from the audience, and I want, I want to say also, by the way, congratulations, Rachel. You got a 4-0 on heart and soul as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. But we're going to ask students to ask the questions first, and then we're going to bring everyone in. I have to play just for a moment my, kind of my social democratic self and ask you the following, that in your analysis, I think a lot of people in the room will agree with pieces of your analysis, maybe even more than pieces of your analysis. You didn't mention, as it affects our country, um, roughly 30, depending on how you want to count it, 30 or 40 years of rising inequality. And um, you know, tribalism doesn't have to come from economics. In, in the Netherlands, for example, it clearly doesn't because their economy is very strong. But here, um, you can, I think you can definitely see it not only because of straight up economic inequality, but also the sharp differences by region in the country. What role does that play in the way you look yeah. at the problems we face now? Yeah, you can tell a lot of stories to explain how we got where we were. Uh, and they're all, they all have contains pieces of the truth. I tell the cultural story. I tend to be more of a cultural determinist than an than a economic determinist. But the, these things you, are inseparable. So to me, the rising inequality is in part a product of cultural decay, that growing up in areas where, um, uh, where there aren't tight family structures, where human capital is not nurtured, uh, it leads to people at a young age having very little chance of having um, good life outcomes. Uh, and on the, but I also have to, you know, it's always a mistake to separate culture from economics. Uh, if you grow up, uh, you know, in a, college, in a home where your folks made um, uh, $96,000 a year and above, your odds of getting to college are one and two. If they make 36000 and below, they're one and 17. Somebody, I read a manuscript, don't share this, uh, recently, uh, where somebody took, um, all the amount, they took college educated parents, all the amount of attention uh, and extra work they pour into their kids, what's the economic value of that? It's $10 million. So high school educated parents can't afford that, obviously. Robert Putnam's data, uh, each college educated set of parents spends $5,200 per year per kid just on extracurricular activities. So th that's, those are cultural effects from economic disparities. Uh, but I would say one of the things that's blocking us from solving the economic disparity problem is a loss of cultural cohesion and a loss of sense of solidarity and fraternal brotherhood with our fellow citizens. What do you make uh, in that light of the secession of the elite from the rest of society? Because that's clearly a big piece of this story. And that can be told from many different points of view. Yeah, I was with some people at UVA yesterday um, interviewing them. And, and they told a story where the, the top 20% has basically rigged the system. So the bottom 80% just doesn't have access. In my view, that's, that doesn't quite ring with the world I see around me. I see uh, the top 20% would love to share, um, but they're confused as to how. They're, they're playing by the rules, and by and large, things are going well for them and their kids. Uh, and they're not erecting barriers. Every college I go to would love to have more Pell students would love to have more access. They're not erecting barriers, they're just out competing. And so they're doing the right things with their kids, you can't fault them. But the problem is not enough effort is, making, um, is being made to, to help the people who don't have the natural advantages of growing up in a home with two college educated parents. So I don't buy the class conflict, I buy the class confusion. I tend to think that most social problems are caused by idiocy and not evil. Uh, and the only way, thing I do think the separation, I do blame the top 20% is the social removal. Uh, you know, I've written books on, there was a book called Bobos in Paradise, Paradise, which started out as an article in the Washington Post called The Republic of the Red Line. And it was about people who live on the red line from DuPont Circle up to Bethesda, uh, where I lived. Uh, <laughs> And David always makes fun of, of groups he's part of, I just <laughs> yeah. want you to know. And but he distances himself from them <laughs> in the process. But, um, and you know, how many people in that can, can uh, tell what soy looks like grown in the fields, can look at a uniform and say what uh, rank the soldier is? Uh, there has been a social isolation. And worse, there's been a creating of cultural um, signifiers that make everybody else feel uncomfortable in our world. Going into Whole Foods seems like a normal thing for a lot of us. 80% of the people who shop in Whole Foods 
college educated, but for a lot of people that's an alienating experience. Uh, and so we have created this system of cultural symbols that we all get, uh, and a lot of people say, what the heck is that? And not, they look down upon, they feel looked down upon with good reason. Let me ask you just a, a question I think a lot of people would, who have read you for years and listened to you would want to ask. I mean, you've been called every liberal's favorite conservative, which of course means that when you write something that proves you're actually a conservative, you, no one is more hated uh, than you. And Charles Krauthammer was once asked, uh, who's your favorite liberal columnist? And he answered David Brooks. Um, could you talk a bit about your trajectory? Um, and how much, you, know, you grew up in a liberal household, um, you, uh, you could tell the Buckley story, which I, I've always loved, but you can sort of talk about, it's a sort of journey here and it's not quite back, uh, but it's a, it's a, it's, I think it's a story that would interest a lot of people. Yeah, I raised in New York, Greenwich Village in the 60s, very liberal academic parents. The story I tell about them is when I was five, they took me to a bee-in in Central Park where hippies would go just to be. Uh, and one of the things they did was they set their garbage can on fire and threw their wallets into it to demonstrate their liberation from money and material things. And I saw a $5 bill on fire in the garbage can, so I broke from the crowd, reached into the fire, grabbed the money, and ran away. And that was my first step over to the right. Um, and, <laughs> but, you know, I was a conventional Hubert Humphrey liberal through high school. I was a socialist in college. Uh, but I was assigned freshman year at Chicago uh, Reflections on the Revolution in France by Edmund Burke. And I loathed that book. I wrote six papers about what an idiot he was. But it set off something in me. And then when I was a crime reporter in Chicago, I covered a lot of the bad social project, housing projects that were built with the best of intentions, but tr turned into monstrous neighborhoods. And so uh, Bur uh, Burke's famous concept is epistemological modesty. Uh, epistemology is a study of what we can know, and modesty is modesty. It's, Life is so complicated, be careful of how you tr seek to transform it because you'll screw it up. And that's the reality I saw all around me. And while I was in Chicago, William F. Buckley came to campus and he delivered a speech. I, I wrote a parody of him for being a name dropping blowhard. It was just very ridicule, ridicule filled. I said, you know, in, at Yale he formed two magazines, one called the National Buckley and one called the Buckley Review, which he merged to form the Buckley Buckley. And you know, <laughs> it was filled with jokes like that. But he came to campus and he said, David Brooks, if you're in the audience, I want to give you a job. And that was the freakish big break that a lot of us have had, some sort of freakish break. And I wasn't ready then, I wasn't in the audience. I was actually, I was a socialist, I was on TV debating Milton Friedman. If you look at YouTube, you can see me getting slaughtered by the greatest arguer in the history of America. Um, but I called Buckley up three years left later and said, can I come work for you? And he said, sure. And he was my mentor for about 18 months. And then it was a sequence of just trying on things to see what fit. And I finally wound up with, I'm Burkean, epistemological modesty, conservative disposition, but I'm Hamiltonian. I believe in limited but energetic government to create uh, social mobility. And I probably moved a little further left in the last couple of years, partly because capitalism has clearly failed. It's failed on this economic front. And once you acknowledge that structural problem, uh, you, um, you have to move over and figure out how do we fill, fix this structural problem, and you have to use government to some way. And so I'm still a Burkean Hamiltonian mixture, uh, sort of center right. I'm a Whig. If the Whig party still existed, I'd be very happy. There are now six of us. Uh, and then, uh, like a lot of my friends, and this is what we sit around talking about, um, a lot of us who are traditionally conservative, Republican, we're now sort of in the wilderness and figure out, is, are we gonna go back to the Republican Party? Is it dead forever? Is it salvageable? Uh, I have a lot of these debates. I, I actually wrote a book once where I told David I was glad I wrote it because I spent a lot of time with the Whigs, and that's when I realized why he was crosswise to American politics right now, because he really is the last surviving Hamilton, Henry, uh, uh, Hamilton, Henry Clay, Abraham Lincoln, Whig uh, in William our country. Pitt Fessenden, great figure, Fessenden Street up here near uh, Northwest DC. The, um, yeah, we thought we'd do an event called Whig Stock, but that was not a good idea. Um, I want to- Don't take the brown acid where it's Whig Stock. <laughs> the, um, I want to ask, uh, we are at uh, a Jesuit school and I, you came here a couple of years ago and gave 
one of the best short commentaries on Augustine. And I just want to tell one story and read uh, something David wrote and um, sort of ask you about your religious journey, which is as interesting at least as your political journey. There are always rumors that David is about to convert to something. Um, but we won't go there. You're, you, you can uh, put them to rest or feed them as you wish. Um, first, this story. He said, as, and I was raised in a Jewish house, household, though I went to a church school called Grace Church School in Lower Manhattan. I was part of an, uh, the all-Jewish boys' choir davening uh, at Grace. Uh, we would sing the hymns, but about 40% of us, in fact, were Jewish. And to square it with our religion, we wouldn't sing the word Jesus. And so the volume would drop down, and then it would come back up. Uh, so that's one David Brooks story. The other is a friend was paying tribute to him, and the friend said, I didn't mind that David was a better writer than I was. I didn't mind, this man was a Christian writer, said I didn't mind that he's a better writer than I am. I didn't mind that his book sold way more than anything I ever wrote. What really drove me crazy is David would go to Christian colleges and be introduced as America's leading expert on Augustine. That drove me <laughs> crazy, he said. So what is it with Augustine and what is it with this journey of yours? Yeah, well, with Augustine, um I, I, I said it, you know, we tend to think we're homo sapiens, we're cognitive thinking creatures. But to Augustine, we are desiring creatures. You are what you love, so you better pick what you love very carefully. And you become what you love. Uh, and that our hearts are restless until we rest in something truly noble, or truly, or a god, as Augustine would say. And so he was someone who just uh, radiated that spiritual hunger. Uh, and emotionally, you know, tears are always coming down his throat, his face. So much beauty. Um, uh, I like him because well, I wrote this book called Rose to Character. Uh, well, I'll tell it quickly. Um, and I had ten characters. He was one of them who I thought were pathetic at age twenty and amazing at age seventy. And I just wanted to know how they did it. And at the end, I realized what they had. Uh, after I finished the book, and I didn't put this in the book, they all had amazing moms. Their dads were eh, but the moms were all amazing. <laughs> and of course, Augustine had Monica. And at the end of his life, they'd fought all this time. Monica was the helicopter mom to beat all helicopter moms. Uh, and they fought, and she said, you know, all my life I've wanted you to be a certain sort of Christian, and you are. Uh, I just learned the word Catholic didn't even exist back then, <laughs> by the way. Um, and she said, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to die. I thought I wanted to die back in my homeland of Africa, but God will find me. And nine days later, she did die. But at the end, of, but they had this final conversation after years of battle. And Augustine describes it in the Confession of Sweetness and Light, where they rose above the material thing into the realm of pure spirit. And he uses, he has this long sentence, and he um, has one word that repeats in it, and the word is hushed. And so he says, as we spoke, the sound of the wind was hushed, the sound of the birds was hushed, the sound of our voices was hushed. He just repeats it, hushed, hushed, hushed. And you get the sense of this restless heart and this fractious relationship finding harmony and peace. Uh, and it's just a beautiful moment. Um, and what I like about him, and what I like about religious writers generally, is they do take the heart and the soul seriously in the way that a lot of my other writers don't. And so they speak to things that are foundational in all our lives, including our public life. And so I've always, before I had any spiritual thought of, on earth, I always went to Reinhold Niebuhr or Abraham Joshua Heschel because they seemed to be describing the world I saw in front of me in the way, frankly, that journalists and social scientists were not. Uh, and I've always just found it, a, forget, a, a, forget a deeper personal beauty, but just a better truth, a, a richer truth in religious writers. Uh, and a, a, a better awareness of what really matters. In my view, our culture is over-politicized and under-moralized. We talk too much about the polls, and that we don't talk enough about relationship, about purpose, about meaning, the things that are actually most important. And when you do that, one of the problems is you try to fill your spiritual needs with politics. And when you do that, you're, that's called idolatry. And you're really setting yourself up for national problems, which is sort of what we've done. I can't resist. I think, I, I talk a bit about your it, sort of what you've learned from Judaism and what your immersion in Christianity has done for you, and how the two sort of interact. Yeah. I've been 
religiously bisexual all my life. Uh, I don't know if I can say that. Uh, yeah, obviously I came from a Jewish home, and Jewish peoplehood is what I have. I'm um, uh, like, uh, no, I'm not going to say that, but like other early Christians, um, Jewish peoplehood is, is oh, what you're You mean you're the original with. one? The original one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what, well, what I don't find in most religious Jewish services at synagogues is I don't find a lot of faith. And I find that a lot of church services. My hierarchy is that every church service I go to has more spirituality than every synagogue service I go to, but every Jewish Friday night Shabbat dinner has more spirituality than every church service. So there's just different ways of manifesting the faith. Uh, Judaism has peoplehood, has history, has story and narrative and intellectual seriousness. What Christianity offers um, is quite simply grace. Uh, and I find it hard to envision the world without grace. I would find it hard to live and without a sense of grace. Uh, and that is expressed most, um, most fully in, in the Christian story. Thank you. I, I'm going to ask one other question because I know a lot of people want to come in. Um, one of the things I've always liked about David is a great capacity to make fun of himself. He said he was working once on a book called Humility and that the cover would have humility in very tiny type and the words David Brooks in <laughs> giant block letters. But he also once wrote, uh, spoke uh, about thought leaders. Uh, he said, we used to have philosophers, then we have humanists, and now we have thought leaders. Let me just read a couple of things from David. The thought leader is sort of a high-flying, good-doing, uh, good yacht-to-yacht concept peddler. Each year, he gets to speak at the Clinton Global Initiative, where successful people gather to express compassion for those not invited. Month after month, he gets to be a discussion facilitator at think tank dinners where guests talk about what it's like to live in poverty while the wait staff glides through the room thinking bitter thoughts. Um, and he also wrote this, which I particularly love because it's one of my pet peeves. He said, uh, and now the thought leader uses the word space a lot as in, earlier in my career, I spent a lot of time in the abject sycophancy space, but now I'm devoting more of my energies to the corporate responsibility space. <laughs> so you poke fun at this social type. Uh, you are this social type. Um, so are you a self-hating thought leader? Uh, how do you grapple with that, and what does this mean? Yeah, um, I never got invited to the Clinton Global Initiative. Uh, but other than that, it pretty much applies. Um, uh, you know, I've made self-hatred into a career. Uh, and when I look in retrospect at my career, I'm talking about myself, I wrote a book on humility, but um, I've written about the same group of people one level down each time. Uh, so my first book was called Bobos in Paradise, which is really about shopping in Bethesda. Uh, the second book was about... Um, on Paradise Drive was about suburban living and American life. That was more Gaithersburg, Germantown. And then I wrote a book on how upper middle class people express emotion, which is called The Social Animal. And then I went to more, the search for moral character. And so it's been the same thing one level down each time. And I don't know what's below moral character, um, baseball, uh, real estate, actually. Um, but I mean, like a lot of people, and I think this is true of even the most careful, specialized academics. When you're writing, you're working out your own stuff in public. You're not writing about yourself, but you're saying, what is my concern, the main concern of my life? And so in the middle of the knife, like a lot of guys, I got a little more emotional. Uh, and you know, the fan, the, my story is that I'm the only man in America who finished that book, Eat, Pray, Love. Um, <laughs> and by page 123, I was actually lactating. It was amazing. Um, uh, and so then, so I wrote a book about emotion. Uh, and then you think, well, what's ultimate, ultimate, you get a little older, you think about ultimate event ends. So you write about moral character. Um, you feel yourself not surrounded by a web of unconditional love. So I'm writing a book about commitment making. Like, um, you're working out your stuff in, pu in public, not writing explicitly about yourself, but if you're a person about whom, who is sort of typical and normal, then a lot of other people are working out the stuff too. And you can sort of figure it out together. And so I would say that um, it's not only self-hatred, but self 
exploration. And I would say no matter what field you're in, if you're not working out your deep issues, you won't have the energy to somehow do it. You, you, have, to go to, you have to go to what you absolutely need and solve it through your work. Uh, a vocation has to come from some deep center, uh, you know, whether you're a lawyer or an economist or, or whatever. Um, let me, I, I could go on like this, and I probably will come back in, but I wanted to, I didn't want to exclude the, the audience. So who wants to come in? We have a mic floating around, right? Uh, right over here, we got two gentlemen here. Hi. Um, as an immigrant and a journalist, I find it this week particularly frustrating how the national narrative that you were talking about seems to be dragging us towards immigration conversations and border security and whatnot. And then things like yesterday happen, and it seems like a conversation on gun control is completely missed in this narrative. We, are, we, are, we don't seem to be talking about this. Um, with the 2016 election, it, fe it fell a little bit beyond all the political stuff that happened. It felt like that narrative, that liberal and progressive narrative, really lost to uh, fear and uh, a narrative that's focused on fear rather than hope and progressing. What is keeping the narrative pro-gun control and all that stuff to really um, develop and, and win? Well, first on the narrative on the immigration, what struck me about the Trump narrative was that I had mentioned we used to have an exodus narrative, and that sort of fell by the wayside. Um, but Trump's narrative was the good-hearted people of America are being invaded by outsiders and elites who are betraying them. And that's the quintessential Russian narrative. <laughs> It's not really, has not been our narrative. But it's he, no accident, comrade. No, <laughs> yeah, I'm right. sorry. <laughs> but, and, so, <laughs> and so he took that narrative and it seemed to play to people. Uh, as for the gun control narrative, the problem there, and my own position is I'm, for, I'm not a gun person, I'm for controlling guns in any reasonable way. The problem was there is gun control stopped being about gun control and became a culture issue. And, and so people who have guns said, those people out there are trying to take away my lifestyle here. And once, you, once it becomes part of the cultural, ethnic identity of a people, then compromise is, is a dishonor. And so somehow, you know, I, I would, God bless Michael Bloomberg for taking on the gun issue, but it was frankly not helpful to have a rich guy from New York uh, on leadership positions on this issue. Somehow we've got to get to the point where you know, Red America, West Virginians are saying, yeah, this is the compromise we want. Uh, well, and we're, we're not could I ask why, why did Republicans and conservatives just fall over entirely for the NRA? It's not axiomatic that a conservative should oppose restrictions on weapons. Conservatives are the law and order party, and it did not used to be the case that Republicans and conservatives were uniformly opposed to gun control. Yeah. What do you think happened there? I, do, I think it became a culture war issue. And it's not the power of the NRA, it's the power of gun owners. There are, what is 300 million guns in this country? There are more gun clubs in this country than CVS's and Walgreens combined. There's just a lot of people who own guns and who see it as part of uh, how they lead their life and a, a, a matter of honor that they see it as, this is a dangerous world, I have to be able to defend my family. That's the kind of person I am. I am the person who can defend myself. And if you take away my gun, you're really taking away my position of responsibility in this world. And having written um, you know, 16 pieces in 2015, don't worry, Donald Trump will never get the Republican nomination, you, know, you travel around the country and figure, how did I get this wrong? And one of the things you come across is that there used to be a narrative in this country, hey, I'm not the richest guy on earth, I'm not the most famous, but my neighbors can count on me. I, we take care of our people. And for, for some reason, maybe the celebrity culture, whatever, that respectability, middle class respectability, went away as a source of validation. And so people are looking, how do I maintain my dignity? What's my role in this society? And they hung on to that role, which was defender. I'm gonna, I want to go to the next uh, question, but put in the back of your head the other half of his question, which could allow you to be a good conservative, which is what the problem for the progressive narrative is. But answer that as we go. Go ahead, please. Thank you so much for speaking today. Um, I, you said that the national narrative isn't working anymore because not everyone is buying into it. And I think among young people, and maybe this isn't, isn't exclusive to young people, but I think particularly among young people, there's an anger out of a sense that we've been lied to, that it actually, the narrative was always wrong. It's not that it's suddenly wrong, that we just were 
either people knew it was wrong and they weren't admitting that or, or there was an ignorance. Um, it, it, do you share that anger or are we being naive? And, and also, if young people are supposed to be empowered to build a new national narrative, how do we, how do we build a narrative that crosses cultural divides out of a, a well of anger? Yeah, excellent question. So I, I don't agree with, with you on the narrative. I think the, the narrative was um, that the story that America is this amazing miracle that is one of the great blessings of the world, um, that to me is the true story. But I hear you. And so I'm, I, one of the things I accept is that I can't take the narrative that I want and say that should be the national narrative because you're not there and millions of people are not there. Uh, and so to me, the, the, way we, the way we come back to another narrative is to walk outside this building, uh, go to the mall, turn right or left wherever we are, and go to the Washington Monument and read Lincoln's second inaugural. Because there was a guy who was leading a country that had committed grave sins and that had, was divided in eight million different ways and that had really betrayed whatever promises it was making. And, and he was at a moment where his side of one big war was coming to an end and he won. And it could have been a moment of chest thumping. And yet if you read that speech, the key words in that speech are us, all, our, everyone. It's, he, it's a very inclusive speech. He doesn't say Amer slavery was a Southern problem. He says it's an American problem. We all have to be purged for this sin. Uh, and it's filled with humility and, and just insistent unification. And then it's filled with um, just a loving grace, uh, just love piercing through division. Yeah, that's how he ends. Uh, and so to me, that speech is as close as I can conceive of as a model for how to do it, uh, how to build a narrative. But the short answer is it's going to be more you who build the narrative than me, uh, and a narrative that makes sense to you, given what you know about uh, what you perceive of the world around you. But I do think it, I mentioned these uh, people I think of as amphibians who are from one part of the country and from another. So many young people are so diverse backgrounds where they've insistently said, hey, I grow up in, in Bethesda. I'm going to get out of Bethesda, and I'm going to go live in rural Indiana. That's just part of what I'm going to do for part of my life. And actually, my kids have all done that, weirdly. Um, I've got to get out of my lane. And once you do that, you, your job and your life mission is e pluribus unum. How do I take diversity and, and, and create oneness out of it uh, and the way they do it is you can't do it at this level. You create oneness at a higher level. You bring people up to a higher level. And I don't know how that's going to be done, but that to me is the framework as close as I can come. But it'll have to be, come from people who are living, living diversity within themselves, pluralism within themselves, and then who discover their fellow countrymen and say, what do we all share? And so I, I think the questions you raise are exactly the right ones. Um. Uh, let's see, we got, oh boy. Um, let me do two, can I do two here quickly and then David will answer them both. Uh, Harry Holzer, my distinguished uh, colleague, mm -hmm. and then I'll go over. We, we, we haven't had a woman uh, here. Let me, uh, let's do three quick and then we'll. Uh, give it up on that. Yeah, no, no, I don't want to, just to, three quick questions and David will give a brilliant answer wrapping up absolutely everything. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, so David, I'd, I'd like you to talk a little more about one dimension of the tribalism, the political polarization, uh, both why it got so, so bad, and it was getting worse in the 90s, which you've declared, in, in the 80s, maybe all the way back to the 60s, uh, but the extremism, and, and of course, since I'm a center-left Democrat guy, I think the other side's way more extreme. Um, I don't see it getting any better. I look at the tax bill that just went through, and we talked about the economic inequality, the lack of mobility, and you have this horrific, I'm sorry, I'm, Betraying my viewpoint, I can't think of a, a more anti-mobility tax bill. Even all, a lot of the folks who don't like Donald Trump and will criticize jumped on this bandwagon. Even the youngest members of Congress have signed Grover's never, ever, 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 ever raise taxes. It's hard for me to see. And, and frankly, I don't see the millennials bridging that gap at all. If, if anything, they're even more polarized than, than we baby boomers. Uh, I don't know how we get out of out of this, uh, and, oh, and I'll say one other thing and then pass on. I've been part of several of these nice left-right groups, these AEI Brookings teams coming together. They end up being very disappointing, frankly, because once you've signed the piece of paper and nobody wants to publicly 
take a position on something controversial because they're each worried about losing their access to their political. So, so I'm very pessimistic about how we break out of that uh, and, and I'd like to hear your thoughts of how that happens. Okay. And then this gentleman and that lady in the front. Thanks uh, for the uplift, thanks. What, yeah. <laughs> and, and thank you for the wise comments on the tax bill. Uh, <laughs> please. Um, oh, yeah, go ahead and then you can do. Wait, me, please. <laughs> Um, I grew up in the uh, 50s and 60s, high school and college, and this was a period, you know, Kennedy, not ask what you can, what, ask what you can do for your country, not for yourself. It was a time when people were drafted and they went into the military, guys from my college age, and, and met people and went to places they had never even heard of. And citizenship was considered something unifying. And, and being proud and, and also critical of America was considered being a, a good citizen. What, what do you think of citizenship and identity? It seems like, not, like now citizenship and nationality has become a really bad word. Thank you. And then briefly, thank yes. um, Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Brooks, for coming and speaking to us. Uh, I have a question as a uh, self-acknowledged registered independent. Uh, I noticed that your latest column, you say that the two-party system is broken apart. How do you see a potential third party or centrist movement arising, and what might be a potential unifying narrative for that? Thank you. I can't wait to see the brilliant goulash uh, that David okay. is about to create. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm completely clueless, so it's hopeless. Um, you know, uh, let me start with the, um, the citizenship, because that, that, I think, did cut down the polarization, the sense of national oneness and national unity. Uh, and, you know, I, one of the things we have to restore faith in, and this, I think, is a challenge for everybody, but especially for people under 40, is a faith in politics uh, and the faith that you can solve things through political answers. I love the Lincoln movie uh, because it was about politics. It was about a guy practicing the art of politics if you, organize, if you organize a diverse society, you can either settle things through force or through politics. Uh, and uh, I went, you know, we went into this line of work because we sort of loved the game and believed in it. And a lot of people don't. Uh, I was at Yale with a bunch of students from around the world, and we got into an hour-long discussion about, weirdly, the Muslim Brotherhood, apparently, I didn't know this, spent a century debating. They were a community organization. Should we get into politics? And they decided at the end of the day they would get into politics. And their students were debating, was that a good idea or not? Should you stay just an apolitical community organization? And I don't know about the Muslim Brotherhood, but to me, if you don't believe in politics, uh, that's a luxury of living in a good society. That if you live in a bad society, you have to care about politics. Because you're in danger of getting shot in the back of the head, or if you pay a bribe every few minutes. And second, if you don't care about politics, politics will end up caring about you. Uh, and third, and this is one of the reasons I believe in politics, is that it calls forth the highest virtues. This is sort of um, Thucydides' concept. There are certain things that politics demands, uh, sagacity, prudence, really listening to and understanding other people, flexibility, wisdom, that is hard to really um, uh, forbearance. These are virtues that are hard to get at any other level. And hopefully some people in this room are thinking of going into politics. And a lot of my friends have done it, and those who have done it, for them, life in public service is the most, is the, the crowded hour of their lives, the best moment of their lives. It never gets as crowded and as intense as when they served in government. A friend of mine, uh, Samantha Power, you may know, UN ambassador, she said, when I was ambassador, every single day sucked, but the whole experience was tremendously rewarding. <laughs> and government is a lot like that. Uh, and I do think that fealty to the, the politics, the simple politics of trading, uh, united by a sense of national brotherhood, is hopefully what cures the polarization. You can't do it, I don't think you can do it by talking to each other and saying, oh, you're red, we're blue. You have to do it by focusing on a third thing, the third thing you really care about. And we could have a social movement to, in, to end inequality, to end social inequality. You know, I... I um, I'm trying to think of um, hopefulness. And the hopefulness I do find, and I'll end on this question, I'm sort of meandering here, um, is that we are in that hatchet moment. And Donald Trump speaks for 25% of the American people. Um, 
but I, I think the, the sort of what I called in the column a, um, a sort of scarcity mentality that we've got to destroy other people to get what we want. We're in a zero-sum battle for resources, so it's just grab, grab, grab. I think most of us don't want to live by that mentality. And there's a left-wing version of it. Uh, and so I, I see all these people starting new things. And history does have these pivotal moments, moments where countries all around the world are facing the same version, the same sort of problem. 1848 was one of those moments, 1905, Progressive Era, 1968 and today. And out of that, I would just say, don't underestimate the amount of change that can happen in one of these moments. That things that were stuck suddenly become unstuck. I'm living in a world where all of my, many, many, many of my friends were staunch Republicans and they're not anymore. So that's the beginning of something. I suspect the same thing's gonna happen on the left. If you look around Europe, the center left is just collapsing and different versions of the left are growing. So that's a fracturing. Donald Trump may not be good for much, but he's really good at, uh, at destroying old orthodoxies. And I, that last moment I'll end with this is that um, uh, in 1968, there was a guy named Abby Hoffman. And Abby Hoffman was not a brilliant political thinker or a builder, but he was a great political dramatist. And he was really good at exposing what was obsolete about the old order. And to my mind, Donald Trump is our Abby Hoffman. <laughs> and worse, but, but the old order is collapsing, and so something new is going to happen, and just have faith in human ingenuity. So that's my desperate attempt at a happy ending. Thank you very Thank much. You. <laughs>